Hello, my name is Andrea Hassong, and I am here today to give you an introduction to integrative data analysis. But first, I want to thank Mitch and Eric for inviting myself and my colleagues, Patrick Curran and Dan Bauer, to give this keynote address at the Chapel Hill Conference on Depression, Bipolar Disorder, and Suicidality. We're going to start today talking about what integrative data analysis is and what you can do to prepare for engaging in a successful IDA collaboration. Then we're going to spend some time talking about key issues in measurement, as this is where a lot of the questions arise when people are trying to figure out if IDA is a feasible thing to do with the types of data they have access to. We'll then move to talking about some examples of what you can do in terms of creating scores from those measures and the types of analysis that you might use those scores to conduct. And we'll give some examples from the work that we've done in the cross study. And finally, we'll talk about some tips and traps and hopefully lead you in a place where you are able to run from there. Integrated data analysis is a form of data pooling or fusion. And when we started this about 20 years ago, the conversation was about the accumulating amount of high quality data that was being generated and archived and what we were going to do to leverage that data. During this time, there have been all kinds of techniques in this area of data pooling and fusion. And so IDA is really part of a larger toolbox. What IDA is, is a way of pooling data that involves a simultaneous analysis of raw data from two or more independent samples. Now this is different than traditional meta-analysis, which really focuses on pooling summary statistics that you get from analysis of the individual samples. And so you might answer a question such as, what is the effect size of a particular treatment when I'm pulling across different samples? IDA, on the other hand, is really trying to take the data from individual participants in a data set and put them together so that we're answering questions that aren't based on summary statistics, but on individual participants' answers. This is a little bit closer to more recent um, advances in individual participant data meta-analysis. But the difference is really around measurement. Individual participant data meta-analysis might use primary or summary data to generate those across study effect estimates but they pay a little bit less attention to some of the issues in measurement harmonization, which is a big focal point for integrated data analysis. One of the primers that we have put out on helping people understand what IDA is, <clears throat> excuse me, and what it does, is called Integrated Data Analysis and Clinical Psychology Research, and you can access that here. So literally what we're doing in integrated data analysis is pooling the data from these three studies to make one big data set. So for example, we might have three studies in which we have administered some combination of the variables W, X, Y, and Z. In the blue study at the top, all those variables were administered. In the red study, W was not administered, and in the green study, Z wasn't administered. Now you might think that we have to then throw out the data for Y and Z, or for W and Z when we pull these studies, but what we will show you in a little bit is that we can actually have overlapping but not identical measurement and still conduct integrated data analysis. So our pooled data set would include all four variables, but that would be missing in some studies. So we're going to end up using some missing data techniques to help us pool data, create constructs of interest, and understand how they're associated with one another over time. So what are some of the advantages of integrative data analysis? It is an efficient use of existing resources. So how are we going to answer new questions with all of this data that we're collecting and archiving at this point? In some applications, what it lets us do is cover development more broadly. So to the extent some studies have overlapping age ranges, we might be able to look at a longer span of development. Because we're looking at larger sample sizes, we'll have increased statistical power. We also have larger counts of rare behavior, which will contribute to model stability um, and allow us to look at things that we might not be able to look at in individual studies. We'll also directly have access to answering questions about study integration and replication. And finally, it allows us to do this thing that I think is the most exciting part, which is to answer novel hypotheses in ways that might not be possible in the single contributing studies. <clears throat> 
And that might be because they're low base rate behaviors or populations that are uh, rare. So all of these we think are some of the advantages of IDA that we've seen play out in the last 20 years in the literature. But there are also potential hurdles for IDA. In some instances, IDA may not be feasible or may not be possible because there is not enough overlap in some of the constructs across data sets. One of the things that people often find when they get into integrative data analysis is that the data management and how you actually combine the data sets from whatever forms they currently exist in is challenging and takes some time. And another thing is that the ability to account for study differences to test hypotheses can result in more complex statistical analyses that are dependent on the types of designs that you're combining. But when it's possible, we think it can be a tremendous powerful tool. One of the things that IDA can't do, and as you're preparing for a successful IDA collaboration, is good to bear in mind, is that IDA can't overcome bad data. So whenever we're combining samples, we're hoping that you're combining samples that are each uh, strong in their own way, but can be more powerful when they're The typical steps in starting an integrative data analysis involve this type of approach. And these are really based on the types of applications that we've engaged in over time or have been involved in indirectly. But um, this might change depending on the type of collaboration you're putting together. Often we really spend some time with um, investigators thinking about what their theoretical questions of interest are. So some people start with a set of data sets and trying to see what they can come up with. Um, and as this technique has been unfolding and different data pooling approaches have come together, there's more and more emphasis on not just putting together samples of convenience, but thinking about the type of data that are available out there in the world to answer a question. Because a lot of what we do after we are starting to pool the data and integrate the data is going to be driven by what question it is that you want to answer. So we encourage researchers to start with some of the questions and then to identify the contributing data sets that might be used to answer that question. We put a lot of emphasis on creating the collaborative ID evaluation team. Um, there's a lot of information out there about team science these days and how to best do that and think about issues of authorship and data sharing and some of those different issues that come up with any team science collaboration. They're all relevant here. But they can be sometimes more tricky because IDA involves often established data sets that have teams attached to them already. And so how do you put together sort of this meta team approach? From there, you start getting into the nitty gritty and starting to think about what the items are in different data sets that can be used to measure your constructs of interests. And it may be that you have particular measures from different studies that you're putting together, or it may be that you're reading batteries broadly across different studies to try to put together a pool of items that really look at some construct that you might be able to tap in different ways in each of the studies. From there, you're going to start thinking about how those items line up with your constructs, what ones might be getting at something similar, what items are definitely not getting at something similar, and how you create these logically harmonized data sets. And we'll un unpack that term a bit more in a second. We're um, in this approach a big advocate of looking at not just how we might line up our items um, in terms of eyeballing their similarity, but what type of psychometric models we can use to harmonize that data. And once we're able to do that, we're able to create scores that are optimally evaluating the study contributions and anchored to a common scale. And this is really the part of IDA that is somewhat unique from other data pooling techniques, but allows us to take those scores then into any type of um, hypothesis testing framework you're interested in. So when you look at these typical steps, one thing I would just point out is that they really define more of a research method and less of an analytic approach. So as meta-analysis is really a little bit more about how do you conduct a set of analysis, here we're talking more about what are the kind of principles involved in integrating data for this type of approach, and then there's a whole lot of different type of analytic techniques that you might use. So I think thinking about IDA as more of a, a research design question is often helpful. So in this talk, I'm really going to start zeroing in on that fourth step which is how you develop that pool of potential items from across the studies that you're trying to pull together. 
One of the things that I will emphasize again and again in this talk is that you do not need identical items or measures for being able to pool data through an IDA approach. So you do not need the same items for the same constructs across all studies, but you do need to have some overlap. And once you have a pool of items, you're going to identify three types of items that are in that data set. Some of the items are identical, and they are indeed administered the same way across all studies. But given how often we will tweak our scales, change a response scale, change a time frame, change a reference to an item stem to make it more appropriate for the population we're working with, we may have items that are more logically harmonized items that they can be manually modified to be similar, or they appear to be getting at the same concept, uh, content. And so this would be a judgment call that's being made by the investigators, or they might have a team of expert panelists that are helping them figure out if two items are really getting at the same idea. Or it could be that we have to change the items themselves. So one item might have been administered on a yes-no response scale and another on a frequency response scale, but we can recode those items so they both have to do with the presence or absence of, for example, a symptom. So those are all logically harmonized items. And then we have unique items. These are items that are available only in one or a subset of studies and can't be logically harmonized across studies. So it could also be a couple of items that feel like maybe they could be logically harmonized, but truly once you get into them, they really are not. Um, so we have these three sets of items that really underlie any pooled data set. Identical items, logically harmonized items, and unique items. And common items are the ones that we hope come from the identical items and the logically harmonized items. You need some subset of common items to establish a commensurate or equivalent scale for the underlying construct. So how do we know that we have common items? Hold that thought. We're going to come back to that. Let's start with how we get the logical harmonized items together. The first thing we're going to do here is try to identify comparable item stems or how we might alter those response scales within a study to make it more comparable to items in another study. So here's a couple of examples. This is an example of a study we did where we're trying to look at the construct consumption of alcohol. So sometimes our constructs can get a little broader than they were in any particular study. And in the three study example we have here, we've got one item asking over the past six months on the average, how many days a month have you had a drink? And the response scale was an open-ended days per month that was reported. In the second study, they got an alcohol consumption by asking how often did you drink wine or beer or wine coolers in the past year? And there was an eight point frequency scale. In the third study, they were thinking about all the times in the past year when you had something to drink and how often you had some kind of beverage containing alcohol. So a different response scale here as well and a different stem. But we are able to look at these items and say, okay, from combining them, we might be able to produce an item that looks at the past year frequency of alcohol use. And in doing so, we can collapse some of the response scales from studies two and three and recode the reported days per month so that we have a six point response scale that comes out of those recoding procedures. So this is a fairly complicated logical harmonization and it's going to leave us with some questions about how well it worked. And I hope that you're a little uncomfortable with that so that we can come back to that question here in a moment. Another example of logical harmonization is one where it just may not be possible. And in this case, what we're doing is looking at positive expectancies about alcohol. This is a relaxation subscale. These types of subscales that came out of the um, alcohol and addictions literature have a, a little bit less um, development in terms of trying to be consistent across measures. And you can see that here. So even though the stems look fairly comparable across these three studies that we're looking at, drinking health, alcohol makes me relax, drinking alcohol relaxes me, and drinking helps me to relax, the response scales are very different. And you have a frequency response scale, you have an attitudinal response scale, um, and putting them together is really unclear. Can you say that never is the equivalent of strongly disagree? Um, it's very hard to do that. And indeed, later um, analysis of this scale where we're trying to say, how is it holding together the way we think it's holding together suggested we really couldn't harmonize this item. So in some cases, we may not be able to engage in log logical harmonization.
Indeed, we think logical harmonization is often not enough. And so if you're feeling just a little uncomfortable with how we might be combining some of these items, good for you. Um, we are too. And so we brought in psychometric models to try to help us see whether the assumptions that we're making when we engage in logical harmonization hold. So the psychometrics really inform us whether we can make those types of assumptions we're making in our logical harmonization models about um, a construct or a set of items being equivalent across person or study. The harmonized values might, for example, understate alcohol use when we have the free format, but not when we have the interval format. There's a lot of lovely psychology that we know about that's involved in how people answer surveys. And so that will play out in how we harmonize our items. But we might get variance that is not of interest to us in having different item prompts or response labels or even placement in a battery because um, often our measures are embedded in a much larger battery um, and where they appear may have something to do with those differences as well. So there's a whole host of issues that have to do with study differences in how we might see item performance varying when we're trying to harmonize these items. These may introduce artifacts later to our analyses that are really due to study differences in stem or response of an item rather than to individual differences in the construct itself. And that is why we want to use psychometric models to formally evaluate these study and person specific differences and account for them in many ways as nuisance variants so that we can look at how our constructs are related to other things of interest to us. As you're reading this, you may be thinking that, well, you know, this actually happens in single studies and a lot too. And I would say, yeah, that's true. So a lot of what we've been learning about measurement through IDA is something that's informed how we're doing measurement in studies more generally. We want to thank Dan Bauer for some of his work on developing a technique called moderated nonlinear factor analysis, or MNLFA. And this is an approach that we've been using to engage in that psychometric harmonization. Um, this is going to integrate elements of item response theory and traditional confirmatory factor analysis to leverage the strengths of those approach for harmonization. We're going to be interested in this type of scoring approach for not just how many items are getting endorsed out of the item pool, but which items are getting endorsed. We're going to be interested in the idea that the way items are responded to by individuals might have to do with some characteristics of the individual themselves. And so the effects of covariates on how items function in a scale will be important. We also are interested in the idea that when we're combining items from different scales to try to get at a construct, they may not all have the same type of distribution, or they might have different link functions then that we can use. So for example, in one um, project that Dan and I did, we were looking at could we put together an alcohol involvement scale that involves um, scales drawn from consequence measures, from consumption measures, from expectancy measures, which all have different response scales. And this type of approach for MNLFA allows you to have that kind of variability in the item set that you might put together. But the goal for us in IDA is not so much to understand all those measurement nuances, but to get to the end where we account for them and are able to create commensurate scores across studies at the level of the factors rather than at the level of the items. So I'm not so interested in saying, is every item equivalent across studies as I am saying, can I come up with a depression measure that's getting at the same thing the same way in general for everybody in my studies? And so that's the goal. So before we start talking about the moderated part of moderated nonlinear factor analysis, let's just talk about nonlinear confirmatory factor analysis. So what I'm showing you here is a traditional confirmatory factor model, and it could be in this case that I have items that are dichotomous or categorical, which is going to make it a nonlinear confirmatory factor analytic model. And I'm going to walk through this with the example of alcohol involvement as my factor of interest that I'm really trying to understand how I'm going to measure this across the studies I'm pooling. So I might look at items like alcohol frequency, and I've got a set of those that I've pulled across. When I look at this, I might also think about the fact that the way that people talk about alcohol frequency and the way they report it out 
might differ by a set of characteristics that have to do with not only the study that they're coming from, because we might have measured it differently, but also some characteristic of an individual. Maybe we see differences in gender reports of alcohol frequency. Perhaps in, for example, older individuals or college settings, um, females are less likely to pour their drinks than males, and so their reported alcohol frequency and how that relates to hope or how alcohol involvement might be different. So we might have differences in how um, this measurement is holding as a function of the study somebody came from or from their uh, gender or sex. So the first question I'm going to ask when I'm trying to look for these differences is whether there are study differences in the mean levels of alcohol involvement. So I'm interested in whether there are study differences in the alcohol involvement itself, that underlying factor. So I'm just looking at factor mean differences here. The differences, though, that might come up is item intercept differences. So are there study differences in mean levels of alcohol frequency for those who report the same level of alcohol involvement? So if I know that it's easier to have higher levels of alcohol frequency if I have an open-ended response scale than if I have one of these closed-ended frequency scales, I might find that for one study, the alcohol frequency measures are all higher, even though when I look at alcohol involvement as indexed across these 17 items and I take study differences into account there, I still see a bump with that item because the item itself is functioning differently across study as compared to those other items that are part of my factor. So I have two ways I can think about study differences so far and the overall level of my factor or alcohol involvement here and in the extent to which individual items are different across study relative to what's happening. Then I might get differences in my factor variance. And here these differences are really addressing the question whether there are study differences in variance among participant scores on alcohol involvement. And you might imagine that I have two studies that I'm combining. One is a community sample and one is a treatment sample. And I might have a tighter range of responses coming from my treatment sample. For example, if you have to be at a high level of engagement in alcohol coming in the door at baseline compared to what I find in my community sample. So alcohol involvement itself might be variable in terms of the extent to which I'm covering the whole spectrum of um, alcohol involvement that I'm going to see in one study versus another. So I can take those variance differences in alcohol involvement into account not just in study, which is what I'm talking about mostly here, but also in these other covariates like sex that I mentioned earlier. The fourth way I might see differences in studies in how I think about alcohol involvement as a measurement construct is in factor loadings. And here I'm going to answer the question of whether there are study differences in how well alcohol frequency is related to overall alcohol involvement. So it could be that in uh, one study, alcohol frequency is something that is not very related to overall high levels of alcohol involvement. It's not very differentiating. And here's an example. Let's say I have a study that's uh, full of younger individuals, so they're early adolescents, versus a study that's full of college students. And I'm trying to get a sense of their overall alcohol involvement, not just from the frequency of alcohol use, but from their consequences related to alcohol and other factors. At the younger ages, alcohol frequency and heavier drinking mean something different than it means at the older ages, where heavy levels of alcohol involvement are more common and less differentiating. So if my study is full of individuals that are differing in how well this item is relating to alcohol involvement, I might find that that item relates differently. So the extent to which alcohol frequency is a good indicator of alcohol involvement might differ across study as well. It might differ not just because of who's in the study, but also how I asked it. So if I'm harmonizing studies um, that have different ways of asking about alcohol frequency, I might also get differences in how well that item is an indicator of alcohol involvement based on how the studies measured it. So when you put all that together, you have a model where you're going to be able to take into account differences across studies and other individual difference factors in overall rates of alcohol involvement, in the extent to which items are functioning differently uh, um, in uh, terms of how easy or hard they are to endorse across um, samples and individuals, 
I can also look at differences in variance of alcohol involvement across studies, as well as in those factor loading. So I have these four main ways that I can think about study and other covariate differences in how my model is performing. Now that's the full moderated nonlinear factor analysis. And it can become complicated quite quickly. But what we really want to do is be focused on what are those factors that are key to understanding measurement differences given the studies that I'm pooling and given the construct that I'm going to use it. So let me give you a sense of what this might look like in practice. And I'm going to do that by looking back at some of the work we did in cross-study, which is some of the early motivating uh, work in trying to create integrated data analysis as an approach. And the question we were interested in at the time is, do early life experiences like stress and resulting symptomatology serve as markers for problematic trajectories of substance use across the first three decades of life? And what we did in that point was combine three landmark studies um, through a NIDA-funded project to look at these pathways to substance use. And those projects came from the Michigan Longitudinal Study that Bob Zucker and his colleagues have run for a long time. They came from the Adolescent Young Adult Family Development Project that Lori Chasson and her colleagues at Arizona State have um, also been running for a long time. And from Ken Schur and his colleagues at University of Missouri through the Alcohol and Health Behavior Project. I had always had this notion that these studies that began in different periods of life fit together like people. And I was very excited to try to figure out how to do that because what we could do when we put these studies together was look at trajectories of substance use and symptomatology over a longer developmental span than any one study was able to examine. We could also look at lower base rate behavior. So we could look not just at alcohol and tobacco use, particularly in these younger use, but also at marijuana and other drugs. Because even though the base rates are lower, the number of people, the base rates aren't changing. The number of people in the study is high enough that we have more stability in our models to look at that behavior. And then finally, we're able to test differences in estimates relating to internalizing and externalizing trajectories of substance use and how these relate together. Um, and so that allowed us to answer new questions that we weren't answering at the time in any one of the So the cross-study IDA design looks sort of like this. Uh, imagine that what we're looking at here across the x-axis is age that runs from ages 3 to 35. The gold study here is the Michigan Longitudinal Study, which was contributing um, seven ways of data at the time from 3 up to about age 17. Green in the middle is the Adolescent and Family Development Project from Arizona, which started around age 10-ish and went up through the uh, late 20s. And then out of Missouri in the purple here is the Adolescent Alcohol and Health Behavior Project that started with college freshmen and followed them up annually with five-year extensions after that. So they were in their 30s by the time we started this integrative data analysis project. So as you can see, we couldn't have looked at this age span in any one particular study. But we were able to look at different combinations of these age spans to look at um, how we understand developmental trajectories. I'm going to give you an example of combining these studies that looks at the construct of depression. And when we looked at the different batteries that the three studies used, we found that there were 33 um, self-report items that looked at internalizing symptomatology that formed a nice pool. And these came from the brief symptom inventory checklist in two cases and from the child behavior checklist in one case. Uh, or in two other cases. So we had two scales that we were going to be able to combine. And some of the items across these two scales shared similar content. When we rescored them and did our logical harmonization, we were able to create then 33 binary self-report items that looked at the presence or absence of internal and symptomatology. And we were focusing here on the age range of 11 to 35. Now there were variations in the item coverage that we saw across studies. So in the Michigan study, they gave both the BSI and the CBCL and all items were administered. In the AFDP study, they gave the subset of the CBCL items. And in the Arizona study, or in, sorry, the Missouri study, they gave all the BSI items. So we had different overlap. But what we did have was a subset of common items in all studies that allowed us to link them 
and that allowed us to have a broader coverage of the construct by including those unique items within studies that increase, increase score precision. So one of the things that people ask often when we're talking about how we do this measurement and the pooling of items is what to do with those unique items, items that are in one study but not another. So one of the things that we could have done here is just thrown away all those items that we didn't logically harmonize and have a much smaller item set. So they were in all the studies in some form. But what we find is that approach works pretty well in fields like education, um, where you would see in traditional IRT approaches that that's what you do. You're trying to get rid of those items that aren't allowing you to link across studies or conditions or forms of a measure. But in this case, with psychological constructs, the items can move the construct itself and the meaning if we are dropping some of those unique items and what they're contributing. So we find that you have more score precision if you're able to retain those unique items in addition to the items that are common across studies. So we hold on to those. What we did when we started then and what we do when we always start harmonization is we're going to do some exploratory factor analyses and through that, we found that out of the 33, there's a set of 17 items that more narrowly define depression rather than internalizing symptoms more broadly. And it's those 17 items that we're going to use to define depression in this particular. We pulled then an integrated sample for model fitting. Each of these studies, as I was showing you, has a repeated longitudinal component. But when we're starting to do model fitting, we need to have a data set in which everybody's in there only one time. We can't have this nested data um, for analytic reasons. So we took randomly one of the time points for each individual in each of the studies to create a data set that we could use for model fitting. So in this case, we ended up with 641 individuals from um, the Michigan study, 846 from Arizona, and 485 from Missouri for a, for a pooled sample of 1972. And you can see these three samples differ in a number of ways. They differ in age, they differ in gender, they differ in the number of individuals who are children of alcohol or alcoholic parents, in each three of these studies, and one of the reasons we pulled them, is they're all high-risk community studies in which at least half of the individuals come from families in which there's an identified alcoholic parent. So that's part of the design that we're going to keep in mind when we're trying to pool these samples. You see there's some variation in percent of ethnic minority parents and in comorbid um, psychopathologies were not part of the design, uh, as well as a little bit in parent education lot of ways in which the individuals in these studies might be different. But some of those were by design or have to do with how we're combining the samples or we think might be particularly important to bear in mind. So when we started putting together our MNLFA to test whether these 17 depression items truly function the way they think that they do, we included exogenous covariates of age to look at age differences across the 11 to 35 range. We concluded gender we included whether or not the individual had an alcoholic parent as part of the design feature, as well as the study they came from. And when we estimate that MNLFA and look at differences in our factor mean, our factor variance, when we look at differences in our item intercepts and in our item loadings, we find that there are a number of differences to take into account. And so we do find that for some um, when we look at the factor mean, we're seeing differences in age trends. So in linear, quadratic, and cubic age trends, which are going to then say that there are differences in the shape of the trajectory. This is not just a linear trajectory of depression that we're seeing over this age range. There are indeed some study differences in which individuals in the MLS study, that fourth uh, point here in this covariate chart, um, do have lower scores than those in the Arizona school uh, study. And those in the um, um, Missouri study as well have somewhat lower scores. So these are all um, some of the ways that we see effects of those covariates as well as interactions between those covariates um, in predicting the factor mean over time. 
We also saw some uh, differences in the factor variance, although those were more limited um, and some of them dropped out um, as we developed these models. So this is just a snapshot to say that the, we are finding differences across studies and across covariates, and importantly, a, across the combination of those two in how the measure is performing. We also found some differences at the item level. So an example off of here is this item of feeling guilty. So we found in that item, when it was administered, there were some differences um, related to age and how the item was performing. So we saw differences in the extent to which this item was being endorsed above and beyond when you have similar levels of underlying depression as a function of age of the child, as well as the study it, that it was in. Um, and let's just take a look at what that looks like. So this is um, a way of talking about how those item differences and how the item is functioning come out. So that differential item functioning for the item feels guilty as a function of age. And so each of these curves represents the extent to which an individual individuals are likely or the probability of an endorsing a given item as a function of how depressed they are. So that depression is at the factor level across the x-axis and the y-axis is the likelihood of endorsing this individual item. Um, this is a standard normal, so individuals at zero is the average level of depression. And you can see that there are differences in age of how likely individuals are to endorse this item at mean levels of depression. And the probability of endorsing feeling guilty at zero levels of depression, or the average, is much higher if you're 11 than if you are 35 or 34. But that's somewhat different as you move lower and higher on the depression scale. So we can take those differences in how likely you are to endorse an item, given you have the same levels of depression as a function of age. You can see something similar here when we're looking at study and age differences, so a more complex pattern for the worried item. So here you can see at age 11, across the two studies, they're functioning the same way. But as individuals age, we start getting study differences in what that looks like. Those differences might have to do with the populations that are in the study. They might have to do with changes in the battery that surrounds those items. Um, they might have to do with the fact that there are other complex factors that we don't even know about that are happening in these studies. But what's more important here than understanding them for the purposes of calculating scores we can use across studies is accounting for them. So in the scoring phase, we have these final MLFA models where we know what factors are accounting for differences in the studies, and we can take those into account. And we can create optimal scores on depression that uh, are calculated from those parameters. And these are called empirical based estimates and we use those to get a sense of a depression score than for everybody at every time point in all of our samples. And we're literally then using MLFA as sort of this incredibly complex calculator that's going to take these differences into account. To they will end up looking like this. So this is a graph that's saying, all right, what are your MLFA depression scores on the x-axis look like when you have endorsed four of 17 items. And the reason we're looking at this is traditionally what we might do is, particularly with the score when we've uh, got items that are dichotomous, we might say, all right, well, let's add them up and see how many of these you've endorsed and just take a proportion score. And that's a common way of scoring things. And what we see here is that everybody who would have gotten a four on that proportion score actually has some differences in an MMLFA score. And the reason is, because it matters which four items you're endorsing here, as well as the extent to which those covariates and factors come from individuals in different studies with different gender, um, parent alcoholism status, um, and age. So when we only look at scores that are based on proportions, we're throwing away all these other differences that we know about how this item and measure is functioning as a function of who the individual is and what study they're coming from.
And so one of the things that we see as a big benefit of using MNLFA and some of the subsequent work we've done is this important differences in, in the individuals and how their measures look that's beyond what we can capture in a proportion score here. So we have a full set of variants in MNLFA scores where we would have a single score of four from a proportion score. If we use those, we can uh, do a variety of things with them. And here, for example, we're looking at um, just person um, growth models. So we're just looking at little individual growth models over time. And you can see that there's some nonlinearity in these models. So over ages 10 to 33, these are our MNLFA depression scores um, for individuals, a subset of individuals in this pool. And we might want to use those depression scores then to understand something about our original questions of interest. Um, for example, here we're trying to understand differences as a function of study and age in depression scores. Um, and this one we're looking a little bit younger. These are ages 2 to 17. So I'm putting together some um, findings from a few different samples here to give you a sense of how you might use these scores. So we've just output those depression scores, taking them into, um, in this case, uh, structural equation modeling framework to look at those trajectories. And what we see is at the top panel, um, some differences in our depression scores as a function of age that differ um, over study as well as over gender. So we've got differences here in um, the lower line is from the Michigan study and the upper line is from the Arizona study. And the line through the middle is what we see as our pooled effects. And so once we take our gender differences and our differences due to study into account, we're able to pull over that um, trajectory. And indeed, interestingly, when you see the breaks um, or the change in the nonlinearity, it's not at the point of the study. It's at the point of where we see age differences going into that early adolescent, uh, late childhood period. And the trajectory looks a little bit different for boys, what we see at the bottom. So we see that somewhat decreasing internalizing symptoms here for boys where they hold in study for girls in the adolescent period. So one of the things that you can do then is you can predict these trajectories, right? So as we might in any traditional analysis where we're trying to understand something about internalizing symptoms, in this case we are interested in the extent to which we could predict them from subsets of children of alcoholic parents. And this is a question we weren't able to answer in, in any of the individual contributing studies because these sample sizes were just too small and our models were a little unstable. So the question here is whether children of alcoholic parents are all similar or we've got heterogeneity of risk in this population that we should take into account. And we are interested here in heterogeneity that had to do with the different types of alcoholism that we might see as defined by comorbid disorders. So in this model, we're looking at a set of covariates that might predict these internalizing trajectories over time, in which we're looking at predicting age 10 internalizing and changes before and after age seven, where we see those changes in the shapes of the trajectory. And we, we do see that um, there are differences among children of alcoholic parents based on the comorbid disorders their parents have. You see higher rates of internalizing symptoms for those individuals whose parents are both depressed and alcoholic versus those who are only alcoholic. And you also see that those who are antisocial and alcoholic parents versus alcoholic only, that there are differences in the trajectories of internalizing over time, where the slopes are less steep before age seven and more steep after that time. So these are the types of differences that we were able to look at and uncover in thinking about subpopulations um, that we wouldn't be able to answer in an So let me just kind of wrap up here with your introduction to IDA and give you a sense of some of the tips and traps that we are seeing as we're starting to use these types of models. So hopefully what I've given you is a sense of the big steps that you might engage in to, think, to uh, start an IDA project and the types of things that you can do with IDA that might make it worth the investment. And these are the things that I would suggest taking into mind as you're embarking on that journey. First, I'd say spend some time laying out the big picture areas of data overlap to understand the types of questions that are possible to address in your integrated data set. And this is something that you might think about before the conference because I think you're going to have the opportunity to have this conversation live. 
What we're talking about here is are there holes in your data set or how far apart are your assessments? Um, and those types of issues that might make some questions possible to ask and some questions not possible to ask. Think about the data management that might be involved down the line. It will take longer than expected. And so, as you saw, we integrated this data not just with logical harmonization, but with psychometric harmonization, which includes covariates that might have to do with particular questions of interest. So it's not usually the case that you can just harmonize the data and have it there for all questions you might answer. You can certainly harmonize the data logically, but then you have an extra step as you go into analysis. So often people are managing just the data that's going to be interest to the project they're engaging in. We encourage you to think carefully about the final models and control variables that might be important for you to include um, in your analyses for both design and substantive reasons. As you saw, the types of covariates that we included in our analysis were included up front when we were doing scoring um, in our MLFA analyses. And some of our subsequent work that we have done in computer simulations to evaluate the performance of MNLFA suggests that that is critically important. And finally, we suggest that you think a lot about those hypothesis testing that you might do in IDA, as always. And thinking about, we might be able to look at that uh, test of replication over study and be mindful of the multivariate holes that are in our data. So for example, when we're trying to look at some of the interactions between study in parent alcoholism predicting trajectories, we're able to look directly at whether the effect of parent alcoholism on trajectories of depression, for example, are similar across studies, and we can quantify that in terms of how similar that effect is. But in some cases, we may not be able to do that if we have holes in our trajectories. So we have, for example, a model that we were trying to understand whether depression in one year was predicting substance use in the next year. But in one of our studies, they didn't do yearly assessments. They did three-year assessments. So we had to be mindful of how we put our models together to do that type of analysis because it wasn't going to be possible in one of our studies. Finally, let's talk about some next steps in Chapel Hill. Um, real data applications are always important in informing the type of analytic and simulation studies we're doing. So we've been using a lot of real data lately to try to evaluate the extent to which these methodologies are working in the wild, if you will, um, and to use these uh, as vehicles for dissemination. So we have um, crafted integrated data analysis um, sets of data based on college students' reports where we know that the samples are equivalent, but we have differences in the models and the methods um, that we're using to integrate that data as well as in the measurement. So we're going to learn more as we move along and we're excited to sort of see what questions come up as individuals try to use IDA that we might be able to use some of this data answer. And those studies are called Real U and the Millennium Friendship Study and they're a novel way for us to look at this analytic development and um, hopefully they could also be a tool for other people in thinking about what issues might come up in different um, harmonization scenarios. We think another thing that's really exciting is combining studies with less overlap and greater heterogeneity than some of the studies we've done before and some more of these multivariate holes, places where you can't really cover the data set. The example for this work we've done in this area so far comes from the STTR Collaborative, and this is a NIDA working group of studies from um, around the world that are looking at HIV and alcohol and drug use risk. Um, and the studies are remarkably different. And so trying to understand the extent to which IDA can be used when you have that much study difference um, was one of the challenges there. And I imagine one of the challenges that this group could generate as well. So new applications offer new challenges and we look forward to the challenges that you guys might present to this field and the solutions that you're gonna come up with. So enjoy, I hope you play around with this and have an opportunity to see if this is useful for you and your work. Thanks so much. We're gonna shout out a thanks to NIDA for the work that they've done in supporting us over the years and the many different students and collaborators who have been engaged with us. Enjoy your conference and we hope to see you in the future.